You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Freedom is all about choices. And while there is only one Jeep brand, you have the freedom to choose from an epic lineup of Jeep brand vehicles. Hit the trails with a versatile classic, the Jeep Gladiator, or experience the wild in style with the sophistication and comfort of the Jeep Grand Cherokee or Jeep Grand Cherokee 4xe. Looking for a more immersive experience? Let nature come to you in the open-air Jeep Wrangler or Jeep Wrangler 4xe, America's best-selling plug-in hybrid. Whatever you choose, adventure is just one drive away. Visit Jeep.com for details. Based on 2022 CYQ4 sales, GD Power retail sales data, Jeep is a registered trademark. Hello everyone and welcome to History of the Great War episode 161. This is our fifth episode covering the events of the German Spring Offensives, and last episode the first major German attack on the Western Front, Operation Michael, had been launched. Throughout the day on March 21st, the German troops have moved forward, and for the most part they had done quite well. Today we will try and pull back a bit to discuss how well the attack was going, and to discuss some of the decisions that were being made back at German High Command, which would completely change the direction of the effort. Then we will switch over to the British side of the line, and talk about how they were reacting to the German attack, and what they were trying to do in an attempt to slow down the seemingly unstoppable German advance. Finally, while decisions were being discussed by the German and British commanders, back at the front the troops were still attacking, and we will discuss their actions on the night of March the 21st and beyond. The German attack had been a success during the first day, but it had not gone exactly according to plan. On the German right, or in the north, von Bello's army was supposed to be the spearhead of the attack. Their goal had been to punch through the British lines and then be on their way to Arras and Albert. This is not what had happened. Instead, they had only advanced between 4 and 5 kilometers. In many places, the German troops of von Bello's army had been fought to a standstill in or near the British battle zone, which was supposed to have been all captured in the opening push. There were many reasons for these disappointing results. It was on this area of the front that the British were most prepared for the attack, having been in possession of this area of the front for years. The German bombardment had also been less effective against these stronger British defenses. But perhaps most importantly, the fog that had been present over the entire front was thinner in the north. This meant that it had burned off faster, which reduced its utility for the attacking troops. If this had been the only area of attack for the Germans, the situation may have looked very poor. But there was a great success. It was all on the German left, or in the south. As originally planned, the 18th Army on the German left wing was simply attacking to provide flank protection for the real gains that would happen further north, but it was here on the left that the Germans experienced their greatest successes. Many historians put some of this success on the shoulders of officers like Hutier or Bruckmuller, who had been so pivotal in the creation and refinement of the new German attacking doctrine and were with the 18th Army, but there was also many reasons for the success that were completely out of their control. The fog, as previously mentioned, was thicker and longer-lasting in the south, providing cover for the attacking troops almost until the middle of the day. The artillery bombardment had also been more successful and effective against the weaker British defenses. Finally, the British were spread so thin that this area of the front made resistance almost impossible. This had been the area that they had taken over from the French, and the British defenders had both run out of time and manpower to create strong defenses, and they paid for it. While the Germans loved successes, with the only real success happening in the south, they were in a bit of a jam. There had been plans and preparations made for what to do when the northern attack succeeded, but those similar preparations had not been made for in the south, so the question now became, what should they do next? While the Germans had been able to create a large mass of troops for the attacks, their reserves were not unlimited and they only had a small set of divisions, especially the highest quality ones, that they wanted to commit to the fighting, because remember this is just the first step in a longer plan. The original plan had been to feed these reserves into the northern German attacks as the offensive developed, but now they had to pivot, and instead all of the best troops were sent to Hutier and the 18th Army in the south. This is a decision often credited to Ludendorff, and it has drawn some criticism over the years. 
On one hand, reinforcing success instead of failure was completely in alignment with the new German offensive doctrine. From small units all the way up to armies, their entire goal was to keep pushing troops forward to keep the attack moving. In this scheme, it was believed that keeping a successful attack going was more important than where it was going. This generally worked quite well at a tactical level, where outflanking and destabilizing portions of the front were possible, but on the army and army group level it generally draws more criticism. If the Germans continued their advance in the south, they would be advancing into, well, nothing. Well, not nothing, but nothing really important. It was here that they would be marching into the area of destruction caused by the German retreat to the Hindenburg Line in early 1917, and then into the heart of the old Somme battlefield. Neither of these areas would be conducive to large-scale troop movements, due to the damage to the roads, bridges, and overall infrastructure that had been caused by years of war. But this is where the Germans, led by Ludendorff, decided to advance. And while so far the attack had not been the success that they had hoped for, it was the one they had. And from Ludendorff on down, they hoped that they would now be able to take advantage of it. While the Germans were grappling with how best to capitalize on their successes, a very different discussion was happening on the British side of the front. The British had just suffered their greatest defensive defeat since the end of 1914. Along the entire front of the attack, the entire set of forward positions had been captured. On the far right, Goff's entire battle zone and his artillery line was now in German hands. Hundreds of pieces of artillery had been captured, and in almost every way the Germans had broken through the British defenses. 7,000 British infantry had been killed, 21,000 had been taken prisoner. Critically, the British knew that the German attack would continue, and they could only assume that it would continue along the entire front, and this meant the British commanders had to determine how best to respond to it. While in the south the British front had basically collapsed, in the north things were looking better. North of the Flesquere salient, the troops under General Bing had performed well. He had also been able to bring in some reinforcements. Three divisions were already on their way to the front on the 21st, and they would be in position to meet any renewed German effort on the 22nd. They had not fully stopped the Germans in this area of the front, but they had at least slowed them down greatly. Here is Martin Middlebrook from the Kaiser's Battle to give a good, more precise rundown of what happened on this area of the front. Quote, Parts of four divisions in General Bing's Third Army had opposed the main force of the German attack north of the Flesker salient. Two large wedges had been driven into the positions of these divisions. The right-hand brigade of the 34th Division and the whole of the 59th Division had been pushed right back to the rear edge of their battle zone, and further south, the 51st Division was in a similar situation. Between these two wedges, the 6th Division was still fighting inside its battle zone, but its troops were exposed on both flanks and would have to withdraw during the night to maintain a line with the units on the other side. So while there was still a lot of fighting and the situation wasn't perfect on the northern area of the front, the British defenders were still holding on to some pretty good solid defenses in at least some areas. South of these troops was the Flesker salient itself, which had still not been attacked in any strength by the Germans. Along this area of the front, almost all of the troops were either still holding all of their battle zone defenses or had stopped the German attacks within that zone. There had been several casualties in this area mostly due to the amount of gas that the Germans dropped on the British positions, but with the situation to the north and the south, a decision had to be made about the troops in the salient. Even though the troops within it had done seemingly very well, they had always been occupying positions jutting out into the German lines. Since the beginning of the attack, and with troops retreating to the north and south, especially in the south, the positions within the salient were in serious danger of being cut off, and if that happened, whole divisions would fall into German hands. Because of this concern, Bing authorized the retreat of the men on the forward edge of the salient, a retreat of about 4,000 yards, or a bit over 2 miles. This retreat would be executed during the night of March the 21st. We now move to the south of the salient, where the real disaster for the British had occurred. Troops in this area had always been at risk, and there were plans made for them to trade space for time, but maybe not as quickly as was happening. The frontline positions had been expected to hold for two days, but by the end of the first day, many had already been overrun. Most of the troops in this area had been completely pushed out of their battle zone defenses, and large gaps had developed as units pulled back at different times and varying distances. Gov had committed most of his reserves, a dismounted cavalry division, the 20th Light Infantry, and the 39th Division, 
and while more divisions would be arriving soon, the next division, the 50th, would not arrive until the morning of the 22nd. While more troops were always appreciated, Goff was in a bad spot because there was not a great position in which to put them. With so little of the reserve line of fortifications completed, it was difficult to find a spot for the men to make a stand. Any kind of coherent defense without good fortifications would require vastly more men than were available, especially when considering the number of German troops in the attack. Because of all this, the decision was made late in the day on the 21st to order a retreat along the entire sector of the front. The length of the retreat varied based on the area of the front. In some areas, they would retreat all the way back to the River Somme, 10 miles behind the initial front. This was done because it was the only way in which Goff could keep his army in any kind of fighting shape. Even then, he was still not exactly optimistic about his chances of renewing resistance. After making a, a report to Haig's Chief of Staff, General Lawrence, Goff would write that, quote, I told him of the number of divisions which had the Germans had brought into action against us, and the masses still in the rear. I then went on to express very considerable anxiety for the next and following days. The Germans would certainly continue their push on the next day, Friday, and it would undoubtedly continue with unabashed fury for many days. Could our tired and attenuated line maintain the struggle without support? Goff would be criticized for ordering such a large surrender of territory, but he would be supported in the decision by Haig. It should be noted that the French, having promised to provide assistance if the Germans attack, began quickly to assist. Once they were satisfied that the Germans were not planning a large attack in the south, troops began to move north to help Goff and the British. The first divisions would be arriving as early as March 22nd, and there would be many more on the way. They would first take up positions along the southern end of the German advance to try and maintain some continuity with the British as they fell back. Next episode, we will discuss in far greater detail the discussions occurring about these French troops and the attempts at coordinating the defense. But for the troops at the front on the night of the 21st, all of those discussions were in the future, and they were just really concerned with surviving the night. The one truth about human history is that change is inevitable. But the one thing that has never changed is that humans need food to survive. There are many ways to get that food, but one of the easiest ones is Factor. Factor delivers ready-to-eat meals right to your door. All you have to do is heat them up and dig in. In two minutes, you can be eating tasty keto or vegan options or any of their 35 options that they have available every week. So you can choose maybe the cheesy garden herb chicken, maybe the Santa Fe green chili beef skillet, or perhaps the Caribbean spiced tofu. It is all delicious, and if you have a bit of a sweet tooth, Factor still has you covered with a wide range of snack and smoothie options. Chocolate mocha cheesecake, snickerdoodle macaroons, any of that sound good? And don't worry, even the tasty stuff is dietitian approved. Head over to factormeals.com gw50 and use code GW50 to get 50% off. That's code GW50 at factormeals.com slash GW50 to get 50% off. Hello, it is Ryan, and I was on a flight the other day playing one of my favorite social spin slot games on chumbacasino.com. I looked over the person sitting next to me, and you know what they were doing? They were also playing Chumba Casino. Coincidence? I think not. Everybody's loving having fun with it. Chumba Casino is home to hundreds of casino style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere, even at 30,000 feet. So sign up now at chumbacasino.com to claim your free welcome bonus. That's chumbacasino.com and live the Chumba life. No purchase necessary. DTW, void, we prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18 plus. <laughs> When night fell on the battlefield on March the 21st, it was at the end of a very long day for the participants. The German troops had been fighting their way forward all day, and as dusk arrived, many began to settle down to try and get some rest before starting the advance again the next day. Many would spend the night in British positions, some of which had quite the bounty of food for the hungry German troops. Here is graffiter William Adams of the Lear Infantry Regiment. Quote, After having made some sort of a trench, we entered the hut. What we found was a gold mine for hungry soldiers. I think it was a storeroom. There was coined beef tins with cooked dinners that only had to be warmed, choice jams and marmalade and other foodstuffs, things we hadn't seen for years. 
What a difference from our food. We just stuffed ourselves. I found a tin with a hundred cigarettes. They were the best I'd ever smoked in my life. We opened every tin in sight because none of us could read English. I especially remember a tin with baked beans and pork. I enjoyed that very much. While many German troops stopped to prepare for the next day, troops behind the front continued forward. This included moving forward as much artillery as possible. Here is Pioneer Wilhelm Neber of the 27th Pioneer Battalion. Quote, there was never any rest for us. Some of the artillery horses had been killed by shell fire, and we received orders to help get these guns forward before morning. We had no meal. The artillerymen had no meal. We all were fed up with this lousy job, and there was a great deal of swearing between us before the night was over. There was also some troops that had, were neither staying or moving forward, but were instead moving to the rear. With the first attacks complete and the line pierced in many places, some of the best German troops, the stormtroopers and Jaeger battalions, were already on their way back to billets behind the line. They were now destined to move north and prepare for the next large German attack in Arras. This was also true of some of the heavy artillery on the northern side of the German attack. The initial plan had been for the artillery on the southern side of the attack to move north after the first day, but with the shift in German focus, it was now the northern guns that would be moved for the next attacks. They only had about a week to prepare for the Arras attacks, or at least that was the plan on March the 21st, and it meant that the guns had to move very quickly. For the British troops, most of the night was spent retreating along the entire front. The largest of these retreats was in the south, and here men from four divisions were pulling back, with similar movements happening in the Flescaire salient. Given the general state of confusion at the front, it took time for all of the units to get the appropriate orders to retire, and some were already preparing to continue the defense along the line the next day. Here is Captain P. Howe of the 10th West Yorks. Quote, it was customary for company commanders to send in a report of the day's events, so I went to a dugout to write it and had a cup of cocoa. I must have been tired because I went to sleep, but was awakened in a few minutes by a messenger. As I looked up, I saw a small mouse balanced on the rim of the cocoa mug, having a sip. The message was to the effect that the enemy were behind us on the left and right, and I was to retire as quickly as possible, to have her core, I think destroying everything as I went. The first obvious thing to destroy was the dugout, so I threw a phosphorus bomb into it in order to set fire to the timber stairway and the framework of the dugout. As I did so, I thought, poor little mouse. I didn't have time to see if the fire started. We formed the company up on a road and marched back to Havercore. It was a very orderly retreat, at least it was that night. While the frontline troops were retreating, behind them many units were moving up to provide assistance in defense the next day. Sometimes this came in the form of replacements, like Private Walter Hare of the 31st Division. He was moved up from a replacement depot behind the front and was not exactly optimistic about his skills in fighting, saying, quote, The sort of training we did wasn't a scrap of use to us when we got to France, because the only thing we'd learned was to slope arms and salute and things like that. You don't slope arms when you're in the trenches, and you don't salute officers when you're in the trenches. You've something else to do. I did fire five rounds from my rifle, but I was never told where those five shots went to. There had also been reinforcements moving up throughout the day, and officers trying to keep those men moving back in order. One of those officers was 2nd Lieutenant E. Hackwell Smith of the 30th Division. Quote, I collected some men from coming back, and this brought the strength of the platoon up to about 60. I was lucky enough to get a hold of a stray Vickers machine gun and its team, and I also got another Lewis gun off of one of our airplanes, which was forced to land near my trench. This meant that I now had three machine guns and about 60 rifles, and for the fact that my trench was unwired, I should have felt very confident. The lieutenant's position was then attacked, and later he would continue his account. Quote, I hadn't liked the situation in the least for the previous 15 minutes. None of our field guns had been firing, and I heard no rifle fire either from the rest of my battalion or from the battalion on my right. And I knew that if they had still been in position, they would have been fighting hard. But my orders were to hold to the last. And then his unit experienced even more attacks, and then he would continue. Quote, the Bosch had nearly joined up around us. I couldn't withdraw to our rear, so we slipped off to our right rear. 
Naturally, as we left the trench, we came under rifle fire and machine gun fire, and they also got a couple of guns onto us and sprayed us with high shrapnel. But by a miracle, we got across the open by only dropping about a dozen men, who most unfortunately had to be left behind. Along with the infantry, the artillery was also caught up in a cycle of retreat and defense, with Sergeant A. Dunbar of the 236th Battery taking part. He would say, After we had fired all of our ammunition, we were ordered to go further back, and into another field for the night and to replenish our ammunition. A couple of dozen wagons of live shell had been ordered from the divisional ammunition column, and our CO had also asked for a dozen empty wagons to recover the piles of empty cartridge cases that we had left at our last gun position in a hurry to get away. The empty wagons duly arrived, and I was detailed to act as guide back to our old position. I was not amused. At the time we got our, to our guns, we thought at least a whole battalion of German infantry were in the next field, and it seemed madness to try to recover those cases. However, orders is orders, so we started back. With the British retreating, the attack resumed on March the 22nd. Once again, there was fog over the battlefield, which helped the Germans to continue their advance. Many of the British units now found themselves out of their prepared positions, which made it even more difficult to try and slow down the German attacks. Private Alex Jamison was in a unit that was moved forward to try and help defend what was theoretically a line of defenses. Quote, the green line was supposed to be really something outstanding in the way of a defensive line, but it was never completed. And when we came back into it, we thought the trenches must have been intended for tank traps. They were so wide. They were twice the width of a normal trench, about 12 feet wide, and they had no fire steps. That was the first moment that I was frightened, really frightened, because the orders came along. This position must be held at all cost until the last man. Of course, what happened was that when daylight came on the morning of the 23rd, we had been outflanked and we were out in the blue. The order came to retire once again, which I must say came as a great relief to me. By the 23rd, with the German troops continuing forward and now 15 miles from their starting positions on some areas of the front, Goff's forces were beginning to fall apart completely. Goff's army was beginning to lose contact with Bing on the left and the French on the right. On the 24th, it was more of the same, with the British falling back and the Germans following. Every day in the morning, the Germans would continue their attack until night fell. Then they would try to rest to renew the advance the next day. The Germans also ruled the skies over the battlefield, with one British pilot, Lt. Rudolf Stark, being one of the British pilots who did get a chance to fly over the battlefield, saying, quote, Below us a battery is firing, infantry are advancing to storm, columns take cover in trenches and behind rising ground. Everywhere I see flashes, smoking, flaming mouths of cannons. While the advances continued, the Germans continued marching, and their pace would continue to increase. On March 26th, they would make 9 miles. On the 27th, 10. Operation Michael had changed. It was no longer a battle. It was a chase. This was a great victory, but it was also starting to cause some problems for the Germans. To start with, the supply system behind the front had been set up under the belief that the largest advances would be in the north. But now, with the troops in the south pushing deeper and deeper into enemy territory, it was becoming harder to keep them supplied. The other two German armies under Bello and Marwitz were also advancing now, which put an even greater strain on the German supply system. Then there was also the matter of where these armies were going, and on this question Ludendorff was seemingly pretty indecisive. Bello was told to turn north, which was the original plan, Marwitz was to drive directly west to a point between Arras and Amiens, and Huntier would continue south and towards Nuyon. This represented a continual increase in the scope of the attack, as the armies basically marched in different directions, and this spread the German troops thinner and thinner as they pushed forward. Perhaps Ludendorff thought that he could take these areas, and by doing so, decisively rend the front in two, or maybe even defeat the British altogether. But at the same time, troops were already moving north for Operation Mars. What was being asked of the German army was growing by the day. It's a massive case of scope creep, to put it in modern business terms. The one area that Ludendorff did not initially put much focus on was Amiens. 
As I mentioned in a previous episode, the city was very important because it was a huge nexus of rail transport with a huge portion of British supplies for the southern end of their front going through the city. Something like 80% of all north-south rail traffic behind the British front went through Amiens, so it was obviously very important. However, it was not initially an objective of the German attack, and when the attacks were reorganized to focus on the south, it was again not high on the German priority list. Ludendorff was still far more concerned on taking Arras, and beginning the process of rolling up the British lines. It is very possible that if the Germans had put more focus on Amiens, and given more reinforcements to Marwitz in the center, the Germans could have taken the city. Even as late as March the 23rd, it was lightly defended. But by the time Ludendorff changed his mind, and made Amiens the primary point of Marwitz's effort, French reinforcements had already begun to arrive on the scene. Over the coming days, more attacks would be launched, but by this point the attacks were beginning to bog down. This was due to a huge variety of reasons, which we will discuss in detail next episode. But for now, I will leave you with a quote from Lieutenant Rudolf Binding, who tells a story about one of the reasons that the German advance would begin to slow, and eventually come to a halt. This is a pretty long story, but I think it's worth it. Quote, Today the advance of our infantry stopped near Albert. Nobody could understand why. Our airmen had reported no enemy between Albert and Amiens. The enemy's guns were only firing now and again on the very edge of affairs. Our way seemed entirely clear. I jumped into a car with orders to find out what was causing the stoppage in front, and as soon as I got near the town I began to see curious sights. Strange figures who looked very little like soldiers, and certainly showed no signs of advancing, were making their way back. There were men driving cows before them on a line. Others who carried a hen under one arm and a box of notepaper under the other. Men carrying a bottle of wine under one arm and another one open in their hand. Men who had torn a silk drawing room curtain off its rod and were dragging it to the rear as a useful piece of loot. Men were writing paper and colored notebooks. Evidently, they had found it desirable to sack a stationer's shop. Men dressed up in comic disguise. Men with top hats on their heads. Men staggering. Men who could hardly walk. When I got into town, the streets were running with wine. Out of a cellar came a lieutenant of the 2nd Marine Division, helpless and in despair. I asked him, what is going to happen? It was essential for them to get forward immediately. He replied, solemnly and emphatically, I cannot get my men out of this cellar without bloodshed. Thank you for listening, and I hope you will join me next week as our story of Operation Michael continues.